Professor Schur is currently the principal investigator on a two-year National Institute of Health grant to study genetics, police investigation, and constitutional privacy. I believe that's in his title. He has also co-designed and taught a national model, the National Institute of Health funded Summer Faculty Institute at Dartmouth. And that is where Dr. Mather and I first met Buzz is his nickname, okay, that educates undergraduate faculty from around the country in the ethical, legal, and social implications of the Human Genome Project. He's lectured to judges, attorneys, educators, and other regionally and nationally on a variety of genetics and law issues. Professor Schur is the chair and president of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, and I believe he was in town for an ACLU National Board of Directors meeting. Welcome to Professor Schur. It's a pleasure to be here at St. Francis. Uh, th how many of you are taking a course either from Dr. Noland or Dr. Matur? Okay, you can, uh, my email address is up there. I've had them as students. I was their teacher. So if you want, uh, you know, interesting information about them to bring them back into line, feel free to get in touch with me by email. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is something that's been happening increasingly uh, around the United States and uh, I've heard of a couple places overseas where it's been happening. Uh, and it involves uh, how we go around our daily business scattering our DNA all over the place and what possible consequences that may bring to us uh, if, uh, if the police suspect us of committing a crime. But let me give you a little background here. Uh, I have a background. I've, I started litigating forensic DNA cases back in uh, the early 90s uh, when uh, well before the OJ Simpson case so I've been involved in litigating these cases for about 20 years uh, and and forensic DNA cases come in uh, in three forms they come in the kind of the classic a murder occurs the police find a sample of, uh, of bodily fluid like blood at the crime scene. They test it. It's clearly not from the victim. Arguably, it's from the person who committed the crime. They investigate the crime. They gen generate a bunch of suspects. Uh, they focus on one suspect. They get enough uh, uh, evidence to get a search warrant from a judge. They get they generate what's called probable cause. They get a search warrant from the judge so that they can get a blood sample or a saliva sample from their prime suspect, and then they do forensic DNA testing. They develop a genetic profile of the crime scene sample of unknown origin, of the suspect sample. Uh, they compare them. If they match, they then, uh, they then compute how unlikely or likely it would be that this match between the crime scene samples genetic profile and the suspects genetic profile is a coincidence or not. Uh, I had a case, I've had cases that run from uh, 1 in 21 chance that it's a coincidence to a 1 in 240.5 quadrillion chance uh, that it's a coincidence. Uh, two interesting things about the one in 240.5 quadrillion case I had. Uh, it was pretty good evidence that they had the right suspect because there haven't been 240 quadrillion, 240.5 quadrillion people alive in the entire history of the earth. So probably they had the right person. The other interesting thing about it, if you think about it, is why did the forensic lab feel the need to add the extra 0.5 quadrillion onto that equation? Why couldn't they round it off to just 240? They felt some compelling need to make it that much more convincing by adding an extra 0.5 quadrillion. I'm sure it made all the difference in the case. Um, the second way p the police can solve uh, crimes in which the cri there's a sample of unknown origin at the crime scene is they can develop a genetic profile just of the crime scene sample uh, and then run that profile which comes, it ends up being in the, the current testing out there called STR testing, it ends up being a, 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 a sequence of numbers over 13 genetic locations. And they run it through a genetic database. 
New York State and every state in this country and the federal government have genetic databases. Depending on the state you're in, uh, everyone who's convicted of certain felonies is required to give a, a blood or a saliva sample from which they can generate your genetic pro profile and put it into the database. Uh, some states, if you're convicted of any felony, you're required to give that, um, uh, that uh, Crime, that sample, uh, in, in, in an increasing number of states if you're convicted of any felony and some misdemeanors. And then more recently in a few states and federally, it is now the case in those few states and federally, if you're arrested, just arrested for certain crimes, you're required to give uh, a sample from which they can generate a genetic profile and put it into the database. The constitutionality of the convicted databases, so to speak, has been upheld in virtually every circumstance, and the litigation surrounding the constitutionality of the arrestee database is still up in the air. There's cases going both ways so far. But with those databases, they don't, the police don't need a suspect. The police can just run the genetic profile of the crime scene sample through the database and see if they come up with a 13 location match. And if they do, it's very likely that they have the, likely have the person who committed the crime, or at least the person who left that crime scene sample uh, there. Uh, and then they'll go investigate that person. So this is a new development with these databases. And then what I'm going to talk about today is surreptitious sampling, a whole different way of going about it. I'm just going put to put, put you that on hold right now and come back to that. So this is an article in the New York Times about four years ago. They swabbed the cheek, and this is, to me, this is incredibly creepy. This is about a genealogist. How many of you have family, uh, like parents or grandparents, who are obsessed with genealogy? Yeah, like, I don't believe there's only one of you. Okay, fine. <laughs> There's only two of you who are willing to admit it, but there's this group of people out there, and they've been around for hundreds of years, who are obsessed with genealogy. Where did they come from? What does their family tree look like? With DNA evidence, it's taken on a whole new spin. So this woman named Daryl Teat, uh, goes, she, like, she wants to complete her family tree. And she's got the so-called missing link in her family tree. So she once waited outside a restaurant with a test kit, hoping to ca capture, a, capture a reluctant would-be relative's DNA on a coffee cup. Uh, people, this is, a, this is a, to say the least, people who realized the potential of DNA, said Catherine Bor Borges, a co-founder of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, will go to great lengths to do it. So. Uh, Daryl Teat, 63, a wastewater coordinator, recently found herself staking out a McDonald's, the man she believed was the last male descendant of her great, great, great grandfather's brother, you know, someone real close to her, <laughs> had refused to give her his DNA, so she decided to get it another way. I was going to take his coffee cup out of the garbage can, said Ms. Teat, who traveled to the Georgia mountains from Tampa, Florida with her test kit. And this is the creepy part to me. I was willing to do whatever it took. So this woman is out there in the United States, and there are other people doing this, stalking these people that they think and waiting for them to leave some DNA so they could, uh, so they could collect it and see if they got the right person, just to complete the genealogy. Um, I'll... I'll <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite quote in this whole thing at the end. It drives me nuts, Ms. Teat said, knowing I can get to the bottom of it if people would just cooperate. Left out is and hand over some of their DNA to this complete, arguably a little strange woman who asked them for it. So my question to all of you, if, if Daryl Teat came up to you and asked you for some of your DNA because she thinks somebody back in her you know, ancestry might be related to you. How many of you would say, sure, you can have some? Nobody? One person, two, oh, we got a few, okay. We got a few. So, I mean, it's an interesting, you know. 
Now, I, had, I, I made this presentation at a school out in Missouri, in northeast Missouri, called Truman State University. And one student uh, raised his hand in the question and answer period and said, you know, I'm thinking that this DNA genealogy thing would be a good uh, dating line to open up a conversation with. So I offer that for what it's worth. I'm not sure, yeah, well, I'll leave it at that. So what about this circumstance? A mother of a young daughter is uncertain who the father of her child is. Her daughter has begun to ask about her father. She suspects one of two men, suspects may be a, a somewhat you know, uncharitable word. She suspects one of two men and neither of them are willing to subject themselves to paternity testing. Gracious giving people that we men are. She arranges for a private detective to follow each of them around to collect some DNA droppings without their knowledge. Based on the resulting paternity testing, one of these men turns out to be the father of her daughter. Anyone bothered by this? No? What, why does it bother you? Back in the day, when you went to Starbucks, um, you drank your coffee, then you threw the cup out, right? And you, you abandoned your DNA, right? You didn't collect your DNA that was on that coffee cup and took it, take it with you. You gave up your privacy in that DNA when you threw it out. Fair? We'll come back to this. I mean, it's a very good, the privacy concern is, is a real concern, and, and that's much of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but the other side of it is, in addition to the interest that you all were talking about, I mean, the other side of it is you, you gave it up. You know, it's, it's not like they invaded your body to go in and get it. That's, you know, in, in the good old days, before DNA, they had to go in your body to get, you know, saliva or to get um, uh, blood so they could do blood grouping testing, unless they got lucky and you cut yourself and left some blood in a, in a public place. But one of the changes that's come about with uh, DNA testing and its technological sophistication is they can, you know, they can get DNA from very small amounts and f that are not even in the body. We'll come back to that thought. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. So this is the example, the kind of thing I want to talk about uh, in this lecture. Uh, this guy spits on the sidewalk. Uh, his DNA becomes as public as if he had been advertising it across his chest. They've been following this guy, Leon Chat, uh, for uh, a long time. Um, they think uh, he had committed an old rape case back in 1974. This is in 2007, 2008. Uh, and they were able to get his saliva off the sidewalk and do uh, a DNA sampling from it. Uh, while secretly collecting a suspect's DNA may be, may be an unorthodox approach to solving crimes, prosecutors say it crosses no legal boundaries, that when someone leaves their DNA in a public place via flakes of skin, strands of hair or saliva, for example, they give up any expectation of privacy. And, and that's what you and I were talking about, and that's what, that's what the rest of this talk is going to be about, playing out that idea computers instinctually. I, I, I have a lot of respect for them, but I also uh, am very skeptical about things they say. For example, uh, if we felt it wasn't proper and we didn't have a strong legal foundation, we wouldn't have done it, says the prosecutor in this case. Um, that's not been my experience with prosecutors. The, the general rule is if they think they can get away with it, they'll do it and let the other side bring up the problems with it. So, um, now I'm going to give you a handy dandy guide to uh, all you need to know about the science of forensic DNA testing um, to understand this issue. Those of you who are taking, any of you taking a genetics course of any kind? You said you had more than like four students in your genetics class. Well, well, maybe they're coming in a little later, right. But maybe they've forgotten they're in the class. You all who have, are taking or have taken genetics classes, you can take a little nap while I go through this science portion of the lecture. Uh, so, 
DNA, where is DNA? It, you know, obviously, it's present in every cell in your body. Uh, and in every cell that has DNA, which is every cell in your body, all your DNA is present. There's not just tip of the finger DNA in the cells in the tip of your finger. It's all your DNA is in every single cell, which is a useful thing when we're talking about criminal investigation. And this technology that came into being in the 80s, I think, PCR technology, uh, allows a scientist to mine even a, one cell, in theory, for all your DNA. Uh, we're not more than a year or two away from it costing no more than $1,000 to sequence your entire genome. Um, uh, so, you know, if you if, save your money up, you too can have your genome sequenced completely in another year or two to compare to uh, uh, he or she with whom uh, you're considering having a long-term relationship. You know, you can exchange uh, uh, genome sequences with each other. Uh, or you, know, you can send them off to Daryl Teat, too. I know she... Um, and those cells that have your DNA in it are not, and all your DNA in it, are not just inside your body. For example, you can get, I'm going to get ambitious here, back there. you can get DNA from hair, particularly hair roots, blood, dandruff, another reason to use a good shampoo, <laughs> saliva, sweat. I had a case in, uh, in suburban Boston, Massachusetts. You know, this is like a bad day for at work for a bank robber. He goes in and he robs a bank. He's wearing a Boston Red Sox at that time. A baseball hat at that time. People were like to be known to be fans of the Boston Red Sox. No longer the case after last night. Uh, uh, and they developed a genetic profile of the robber from the dried sweat on the inside of the hat band, of uh, the baseball cap. So. A word of advice, those of you who are considering a career in bank robbery, <laughs> two, two choices. Don't leave your baseball hat at the crime scene when you rob the bank. Take it with you. Uh, the better choice is don't wear a baseball hat to the crime scene. Um, that was the humorous moment in this lecture. I'm not seriously advocating that you engage in, in armed robbery. <laughs> Mucus, urine, other waste products, a sneeze. The stories are legendary and many uh, from research scientists who use PCR technology in labs of the experiment, you have to start the experiment over because someone sneezed in the lab and DNA got into the sample. It's really annoying. A cough. Ironically, you can get DNA from a fingerprint. It's kind of cool. Uh, a skin cell. You know, we're shedding skin cells all the time. Uh, any body tissue. Um, so basically, from, you know, increasingly technological developments will only improve our ability to extract DNA from smaller and smaller cell droppings. And we're just, you know, we're shedding DNA throughout our day. Uh, so this is kind of a, you know, it's almost a bit it's appropriate here at St. Fra Francis, uh, something of a biblical proposition, give of, give of yourself unto the world. Um, that's what you're doing. You're giving up your DNA all day long, every day. So here's where you can find what I like to call out-of-body DNA, a stamp. You know, who have, how many of you have ever heard of the Unabomber? Uh, the Unabomber, one of the ways, one of the types of evidence they had in the Unabomber case is they got his DNA off the back. This was a guy who, an anti, to say the least, an anti-technology guy who sent bombs to technology professors and workers around the country. Some of them were killed, some of them were severely maimed. Uh, and they got DNA off the back of a stamp in one of the letters he sent to one of these people. Uh, toilet paper, we don't need to go there. Kleenex, 
silverware, copper, glass, a, you can get DNA out of a bite mark. There's a number of sexual assault cases where the, uh, the assailant has bitten the individual uh, who he is sexually assaulting, and they've been able to get the assailant's DNA from the bite mark. Eyeglasses, those of you who are so, f I don't see anyone who is here physically, but listening to music on their iPod or uh, iPhone or something, but those, you know, iPod earpieces that you stick in. Uh, hat band, bandana, clothing, clothing of someone else. We went through the problem that these two have. Uh, hotel room, this is a little gross, but you just don't want to, the forensic scientists have studied the bed spreads in hotel rooms. You just don't want to know how much DNA, even after they've been laundered, there is on those bed spreads. It makes you never want to go to a hotel again. Uh, a seat. Now, for those of you who are thinking of going to graduate school, you know those, those answer sheets where you fill in the little you know, circles? In, for the SAT or the LSAT, that's, for those of you who want to go to law school, you'll take an LSAT. For others going to graduate school, the GRE, medical school, the MCAT. You know, basically you're sending in to this central private company uh, your DNA sample with your answer sheet and your answers. Uh, we have no knowledge that they are actually collecting your DNA from that, but there. And for those of you who are thinking, who are old, uh, or let me put it more charitably, since I'll turn 60 next year. Those of you who are more chronologically advanced than others of you, uh, consider what you're doing when you fill out your application to get Social Security when you retire. So the reality is you make your way through the world each day shedding your DNA and I pretty much, you know there's a great scene, how many of you have seen the movie Gattaca? This, this is a, you know, culturally bereft crowd in terms of music, uh, music and uh, particularly movies. Gattaca is this science fiction movie of the future and uh, this uh, Ethan Hawke is uh, pretending to be somebody else because that somebody else has a better genetic profile and will be allowed to work in the company. He doesn't have a good uh, uh, profile, so he wouldn't be allowed to work. So he pretends to be somebody else. And every morning, he goes into this special unit and scrubs all the skin cells, all the flakes of skin that he might drop at work off his body before he goes into work. Uh, it's a very good, it's a very, it's, a, it's the best uh, genetics movie ever made. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah. For those of you who are looking for high quality genetics movies, it's the best one ever made. Excuse me? It, and it also has, for those of you who care about these things, it has Uma Thurman, Ethan Hawke, and Jude Law. So that may matter to some of you. So here's what you can know about when you have somebody's DNA if you choose to spend the money to do the testing. You can get the genetic name tag, that sequence of numbers that counts as your genetic profile that would go into the database, for example. You can find out, very likely, the continent of origin of that person's ancestors, what color their skin would likely be, their eye color who likely are and who definitely are not their parents, siblings, and children. Having someone's DNA tells you who, who this person is likely related to, can tell you some genetic disorders from which they currently suffer, whether they have, you can tell you some just genetic disorders from which they will definitely suffer in the future. For example, if you possess the gene for Huntington's disease, you would, uh, Huntington's disease does not manifest itself until you, about somewhere in your late 30s, early 40s. And you inevitably will die from it at this point, with the rarest of exceptions. But if you, you would get that from your mother or father, if you have it, you're going to get Huntington's disease without question, and you're going to die an early death and a painful death from it. Um, and you can tell that. Just, there's a test for the Huntington's disease gene. Uh, some genetic disorders from which they may suffer in the future. Uh, for example, there is a test for, uh, there's a diagnostic test to see if you carry one of the breast cancer genes, 
one of the mutations of the breast cancer gene that, that increases significantly the likelihood that you will have breast cancer in your lifetime. Just because you don't have the quote unquote breast cancer gene or a breast cancer gene doesn't mean it's, you're not going to get breast cancer. 95, I believe the number is 95% of all breast cancer is not hereditary. The huge majority of women who get breast cancer, they don't get it because they have a gene for it. They get it for other reasons. Um, but you can tell all of this from having a sample of somebody's DNA. Going forward, we're, you know, they're doing more and more investigation in beha behavioral genetics. Um, they'll be able to, to get some sense of your predisposition to uh, impulsive behavior, to mental illness and the likelihood of those related to you might, might have those same predispositions. So it's very powerful information. It's very intimate and personal information. So, and you're, sh you're shedding every day your genetic identity in terms of, you know, what your, what your eye color is, what your genetic name tag is, you know, what genetic disorders you may suffer from, what genetic disorders you are suffering from. Um, all of that is in your DNA that you're, you're dumping on the street. And now, here, go back to that, this, my description of data, genetic databases. You know, they have a crime scene sample, they run it through the database. They don't find a, a person who matches the crime scene sample at all 13 locations. They find someone in the database who matches the crime scene sample at six or eight of the genetic locations they test, but not all 13. There's a non-match at the other, you know, uh, seven, five to seven genetic locations. That means the person who contributed the crime scene sample means two things. One, can't be the person who it matches at only seven locations. That person it matches is excluded from being the contributor. But it also means very, very likely that the person who contributed that crime scene sample is related to the person who, who, where there was a seven location match. That's what that tells you. It's not certain, but it's very, very likely. What the police now do when they find that is they go to a judge uh, and uh, they describe the circumstance. They, well, actually, before they do that, they, they investigate the individual whom it matches at seven locations and find out who his brothers or sisters or parents or children are. They investigate those people from a distance. They figure out who is the most likely target amongst those, and they go to a judge. And based on this, what's called a partial match, they can get a search warrant from the judge to get genetic, to get DNA samples from anyone that the seven loc locus person is related to who might possibly, given where they were, have committed the crime. Uh, it's a new, it's, this has just started in about the last four years, which gives rise to this proposition. Be careful to whom you are related. Um, not that you have any control over it, but uh, it's, a, it, it's a very interesting proposition. So, let's go back to what I call the surreptitious sampling circumstance. The police collect, collect your abandoned DNA from a public place. Who is that who I was, see I can't see your face, you, you, you're behind the sun so you're a, just a dark shadow to me which is awesomely appropriate for this hypothetical. So what's your first name? Uh, Michael. Notice the pause. Does anyone know this person as someone other than Michael? Is this a fake name he's given me? Or? Ah, we have further info. I'm going to, let's call you Michael for this purposes of this exercise. So Michael is suspected, let's go all the way on this Michael. Michael is suspected of committing a murder, right? Uh, we won't get into the ugly details of the murder he's alleged to have commit, committed, but the problem is 
the police do not have enough evidence to go to a judge and get a search warrant so that they can get a, a, a DNA, a, a saliva sample or a blood sample from which they can derive a, a genetic profile to compare to the sample that the perpetrator left at the crime scene. So instead, they follow Michael along. This is around. Now, where do you go? You don't go to Starbucks anymore. Uh, where do you go now? Why the why the change? Oh, it's a financial issue. Okay, so the cafeteria here, where interestingly, uh, you purchase coffee for me. So, yeah, it's wonderful coffee here in the cafeteria. I just want that's that's my story. Um, so the police follow Michael around. He goes and buys coffee, undercover police officer. He goes and buy, Michael goes and buys coffee in the cafeteria down here for, actually, the coffee I got cost 75 cents. How much does your coffee cost? And then there's a, re, a warrant requirement. I'm not going to get into the significant details about how to interpret all this, but this says nothing about uh, the surreptitious sampling circumstance, uh, and, and it uses that troubling word unreasonable. So, but basically, the Fourth Amendment has been interpreted to say, if you have an expectation of privacy in some place, something, and in some part of your body, then the police need probable cause to search that place. That's the basic valuable proposition that we're going to talk about today. If you don't have an expectation of privacy in that thing, then the police can do whatever they want and you can't, uh, you can't make anything of it, basically. Um, question. We let the police take your DNA or we never let the police take your DNA in this fashion. The argument would be that before they collect DNA in this way, they have to have some measure of justification for it, be it probable cause or a lesser level of justification called reasonable suspicion. So how many of you think the law is the way, the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment in this circumstance is the way it should be as it is now? How many of you think there should, the police should have some, some kind of justification before they can surreptitiously sample your DNA? So it's really, and then how many of you, if I talk loud enough, will wake up? Right. Uh, so it's a little, you know, a little bit more on there should be some, some justification side, but not by much. Um, so here's you know, the constitutional question. The technical Fourth Amendment question is, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that which you seek to keep private? And is it an expectation of privacy that society is willing to recognize as a real one? So just because I'm a hyper-paranoid um, and I you know, feel like when you walk too close to me, that's an invasion of my privacy. You know, just because I'm really quirky in that way doesn't mean the Constitution should recognize my expectation of privacy. Only if society is willing to recognize my quirkiness as a reasonable one, as a reasonable expectation of privacy. So it's a, it's a, it's a, in turn, a subjective standard, but also an objective standard, as we lawyers like to say. So here's, here's one way to solve this problem. Um, it's okay, the police don't need any justification as long as all they're gonna use is just the genetic name tag. It's really just, and the argument goes in some of these cases, it's really just like a fingerprint that you leave that like Michael would, the hypothetical state of New York, um, give, uh, people a reasonable expectation of privacy in the garbage they put out at the end of the driveway or you know at outside the stoop to be collected by the garbage collector most states say you've abandoned it it's free game but i'm going to give you a quote from the new hampshire supreme court in their famous garbage case which gave people an expectation of privacy and recognized it as a reasonable one in the garbage they put out for the garbage collector to collect uh, and substitute for the word garbage, I'm gonna read the word garbage, but substitute for the word garbage, DNA, okay? Clues to people is a useful way, but it's, there's more dimensions to privacy than just this property way of thinking of it. For example, 
you know, uh, even if you, you, you say the, you know, my property arguably is your body, but you don't really, it, it's, it's weird to say you own your body, but there's this idea of property that it's a physical invasion, um, that you're invading my physical space, and it's really not a property concept. It's, it's a different kind of property concept, overlapping with the, with the property one. Um, that's another way to think about privacy. A third way to think about, and, and that's a little, you know, that gets a little squirrely when we're talking about out-of-body DNA, you know, is, are you invading somebody's, do you have a property interest in your DNA that you left on your coffee cup? Do you have the same bodily interest in your, in that cell that's on the coffee cup as you do in your DNA, in what's inside your body? It seems counterintuitive. Another way to think about privacy, I'll get to you in a couple minutes. Another way to think about privacy as information. You know, I am entitled to have control of information personal, personal and intimate to me. DNA of the American right. That's not a biological statement. That's a statement about how core the idea, uh, you know, the uh, hate and violence is, at least in the minds of the author of this article, in the American right. Article from, uh, downloaded from CNN Sports Illustrated website. This is, this is a quote from Kobe Bryant. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him. If you're building a championship team, your DNA always has to start with on the defensive end of the floor, Bryant said, always. I'm a firm believer in that. I don't believe in building a championship team on offense. It has to be built on defense and rebounding, and rebounding, period. You know, DNA conveys to the listener or the reader of that article something foundational, something very uh, uh, important and core. New York Times article. So this, uh, that was a, you know, a sports metaphor, a political metaphor. This is in business. But as the electrification of vehicles advances, engineers are emphasizing the need for motors to display their car maker's DNA in the same way a high revving V8 does for Ferrari. So DNA is about core identity.